This broadcast is brought to you by Law School Transparency. Our mission is to make entry to the legal profession more transparent, affordable, and fair. Hey listeners, welcome to I'm the Law, a show that does informational interviews for law school graduates in different jobs. Today our host is Mike Spivey, the founding partner of Spivey Consulting. In this episode, Mike interviews a freshly minted plaintiff's attorney who spent much of his career on the defense. We'll learn about the struggles of going solo, as well as the measurable benefits. Our guest today is Greg Acock. He is a solo practitioner in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Greg is a graduate of LSU and the Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. Prior to starting a solo practice just one year ago, Greg worked for an insurance defense firm. He left because he wanted to be his own boss. Now he focuses on plaintiff's personal injury and spends considerable time in the family law arena doing divorces and child custody work. In your ideal world, what areas would you focus on more? I think uh, my ideal mix would be to, to do a majority of the uh, personal injury area, um, having that defense background. But I really love the medical aspects of cases and getting deep into the serious uh, injuries, personal injuries, dealing with the doctors, all of the experts. I'm hoping down the road that's uh, a majority of my practice will consist of personal injury. So today, how do you find your clients? You know, a, a lot of clients find me, it's word of mouth and referrals, whether it be through other lawyers or friends, the bar association. So that's a big part is being a solo practitioner is picking up your clients on uh, referrals and word of mouth. What other things would you do to grow your client base? Well, I do. Um, I recently joined a business networking group, and, and, and so I do a lot of networking outside of, uh, of, of my practice. I'm really involved in my community. In addition, um, trying social media. Um, I have a website. Um, just day to day, and biggest thing is referrals. Letting people know I'm out on my own. Other attorneys I've worked with, everyone I see, it's constantly just speaking to people and handing out business cards and just letting everyone know uh, my practice areas. Could you walk us through what a typical day would look like in that practice area? Like, sort of take us through a, the life cycle of a client. Typically, once a client comes in on a personal injury case. You talk to the client, you, you sign them up, you take the case. You start the initial process of obtaining uh, their medical records and getting facts and background information on the case. A lot of times these cases can and do resolve themselves prior to uh, filing suit because you're dealing with the insurance adjusters or some of the companies, the claims representatives for the big companies. Uh, you're negotiating, trying to resolve a case because a lot of times some of these uh, companies don't want to face a lawsuit. In the event that a lawsuit needs to be filed, at that point, a typical day is just the day-to-day -day gr uh, grinding out the litigation process, whether it's issuing discovery, responding to discovery, uh, taking depositions of witnesses, defending your client through the motion process as the case gets ready for trial, whether it be a jury trial or you try it before a judge. I, I sort of envision an episode of House where you're getting into the nitty-gritty of medical technologies and language and are you learning about things you, you never would have imagined learning about? And are you getting really deep into the, sort of the medical aspects of these cases? No, it is. It's very interesting. You know, prior to going to law school, I wanted to go to medical school. And then my feelings changed my senior year of high school. And now looking back, getting into the medical aspects of these cases, learning about the back injuries, the different research, it's actually pretty fun. And then to go in and depose the doctors and a lot of the experts in their fields, I am learning all the time about different things, whether it be parts of the elbow, the back the knee, uh, brain injuries. It's very interesting. For someone who's never been, what's it like being in a courtroom and trying a case? Yeah, I think it takes it takes a lot of uh, experience to get in there. But once you're comfortable, if you're comfortable getting up in front of people, I think if you know your case inside and out and you're prepared, it's actually, uh, it's really fun being in a courtroom. It's like a ping pong game or a tennis match going back and forth. Do you have any crazy stories of the judge or the opposing counsel asking questions that you were just entirely unprepared for and how you reacted? Well, sometimes that happens. Uh, you know, the main thing, all you can do is sometimes if you can object and maybe keep it out, if you think it's worth keeping out, that, that you can maybe object and get it out. A lot of times you just have to sit there and look at your clients if they're sitting next to you and try to figure out a way. If you didn't know that or you didn't know that was coming, I uh, try to figure out a way to get back if you get some cross-examination or something like that to attack it. I imagine you get pretty close to your clients. Is it 
a case where you're actually having to guard your emotions because you don't want to, um, you know, for some of these family law cases, I know they can be tough. I'm sure personal injury too. Or is it to your advantage to get closer to the client? You get to know your clients very well, the ins and outs. You have to know your client because there's so much emotion involved. You have to control your client a lot and, and teach them the process and explain when it's correct time for for the use of emotions um, and all that. And, and you have to keep your clients under control as well because you don't want them going out doing something or getting angry or something in, uh, on the witness stand because that could hurt their case. So it, it's just, a, I guess, a mind game in a sense. And you're learning and you're getting very close to your clients just so that you can present them in the best way possible. So we talked about the whole dynamic of from the beginning to the end of these cases. Is it changed any what because you're in Louisiana, and I know Louisiana uses civil law system, which is different from the rest of the country. Does that change the whole dynamic of the representation of clients? Not necessarily. It's basically a set of core principles. They're codified into a um, you know system that serves as our primary source of law. We have books that are called Civil Code, and they basically have three components in those books. It's the law of persons, property law, and commercial law. Louisiana is the only state based on French and Spanish codes and ultimately Roman law as a pair as opposed to English common law that the other states use. Um, so in essence, we look at the legislative enactments or what the legislature considers is binding for us. Whereas in the common law in every other state outside of Louisiana, it's basically judge made decisional law, which gives precedential authority to prior court decisions. The courts don't look to other decisions or other court decisions from other states. So I'm, I'm constantly looking basically at the laws the Louisiana legislature uh, make in formulating my case. But it's, uh, you know, it's the same in trying a case and putting a case on and uh, presenting a case to a jury or a trial. Coming up on LST Radio, we'll learn about how and why fee structures differ for family law and personal injury. Greg also explains the feeling he gets when he wins a case. Not only have you helped someone, but you've got a good result and you can get these people moving forward. And that's what they've hired you for to help you do that. If you don't subscribe to I Am The Law, head over to iTunes or visit lstradio.com. Greg, you were on the defense side until recently. Is insurance defense changing, and how might that impact your plaintiff's practice? I believe a lot of insurance companies today are now moving, instead of using outside counsel, a lot of them are starting to have bigger in-house corporate departments where they're paying attorneys on salary to work for them, and they're not forming out or sending out a lot of the defense files that they used to to other firms. In addition, I think insurance defense practices are becoming, a lot of the firms are cutting uh, cutting their rates really low in order to get the business. So you see a lot of attorneys doing doing matters, I think, for a lot uh, cheaper than it used to be done. So you don't see it affecting your work? No, I, I, I don't see it affecting my work as a plaintiff's attorney. Uh, I, I'm hoping it might make it easier dealing with in-house. When you deal with in-house lawyers, um, I'm hoping it's going to be an easier practice because if you find... The outside, everyone on defense, uh, on the defense side, if they're, they're trying to run a practice too and they bill by the hours. So you may, you may have, um, you know, less work on files and still be able to resolve cases much easier with in-house counsel than outside. So let's, let's transition. What were sort of the vectors and triggers of deciding that you were going to start your own firm? I mean, I've always wanted to, uh, you know, have my own firm. And, um, it just, you know, was learning, having the experience, learning the, the ins and outs of day to day litigation, which kind of helped, uh, you know, move that forward. Could you have done this out of law school? I think, I think it would be tough to do this coming right out of law school or learn, or just clerking for a judge after a year. I think it's important. I mean, having the experience of learning from in the process and just the procedural process of practice, number one, dealing with clients, number two, and then the uh, the operations of a law firm, the accounting, and everything else involved is a total different ball game. So I, I think it is beneficial to get experience with other people before doing this. And what's it like? Like, what is your fee structure? And, and then how do you collect in, uh, money from your clients? Well, personal injury, we'll do that one first. That's more that's a contingency fee basis. So personal injury are usually paid when you uh, settle a lawsuit or if you're successful at trial and you prevail at trial. 
on the family law side, the way um, that most that family lawyers do it is um, I require uh, once I meet with clients, I find out about their case, I require a deposit. And with that deposit, clients know that a lot of those fees are going to have to cover their filing fees, which are very expensive. But in addition, family lawyers, we charge by the hour. And at the end of the month, what I do is I prepare a very detailed invoice for my clients showing what monies I've earned from their account, and it's taken out of their trust account. So the cash flow looks markedly different for personal injury, which is contingency-based, and for your hourly work, which is what your family work uh, law practice is. Are there stipulations on how much you can charge for the contingency-based fees? Yes. On the contingency fees, most attorneys charge um, 33 and a third percent based on any awards. Uh, or go, and some even go up to 40 percent based on if, you, if you're if you forced to go to trial or if you have to file an appeal. And, and that's the standard pretty much across the board, I think, nationwide. So is there a temptation to, I know you have a family, but is there a temptation to dedicate your firm to hitting the big personal injury ruling well, yeah, I think everyone looks for that big case. All, um, you know, all plaintiffs, personal injury lawyers are looking for that case. I think, um, you know, you have a good idea a lot of times at the initial consultation with a client, whether you know if it's good, if you can evaluate the case properly, how that's going to turn out. But yeah, it'd be great to get, you know, a couple of those a year. Uh, but the competition, just statewide, citywide, it's very tough. There's a lot of lawyers and a lot of lawyers advertise as doing personal injury. So it's tough to get those. Similarly, then, let's pretend you're a new graduate with a lot of debt. Knowing what you know now, how would you sort of move the levers to, to manage paying off the debt and also raising a family and running a firm? You know, I think if, if I would have done this when I got out of law school years ago, I think uh, someone coming in with, that, with debt and raising a family. Number one, you have to learn how to balance everything. But number two, starting a law firm on your own, it's, it's very hard and I think it takes time. I think a person, uh, individual doing that would have to almost find an outside job just to balance and, and, and take care of the bills and things like that. Because it is very tough when you're paying uh, rent, insurance, and all the other um, fees required to run a firm, in addition to having family expenses and things like that. It's, it's a very tough balance. Yeah. What's one or two aspects of practicing law vis-a-vis -vis running your own firm that you look forward to and that you cherish most? And what are one or two of the biggest headaches involved in what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? If we win a case or we just do a good job, you get an outcome for a client, uh, whether you have to resolve some, if it's a family issue, and they are very happy. And, and, and you help them, you walk them through the process, and you make them feel good about it. Not only have you helped someone, but you've got a good result, and you can get these people moving forward. And that's what they've hired you for, to help you do that. So that's a great day for me is when someone is satisfied, and we've also got a very good result for them, and they can start to move forward. A bad day, what's a, something bad? Um, I'm by myself, so I spend a lot of time entering my time entries. I do my own invoices. I write my own checks. So that that's tough, too, because that takes a lot of time away from practicing law when you're also doing the day-to-day -day management of your own firm. Are there a program, technology, software, people that you've invested in that make the day-to-day -day grind easier for you? Oh, there are, and I highly recommend it to anyone looking to go out on their own. I've, uh, I use a software called Amicus Attorney, which allows me, um, I'm paperless, even though I do keep paper files, because I, uh, I, I save a lot of my correspondence and emails. It allows me to manage all of my files. It has a billing aspect to it. And even not even touching the, using the iPads and all the programs you can get with that, you, there's so much that I have that helps me. Because right now I don't have someone helping me, so I'm able to dictate myself and then fix all the typing. In general, how much time do you actually spend in court versus researching versus writing motions versus doing all the business side of running your practice? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I'm in court a lot because I represent individuals, and especially in family law, we're in court a lot. So we, get, we have a lot of court dates. We have a lot of trials and things like that. Breaking it down is kind of tough. I would say court 40% of the time, maybe, less than that. Research, 10% um, now. Everything else I'm, is here in the office, meeting with clients, running the day-to-day -day operations, and then just doing the general work, preparing letters and working on the file. So I, I'd break it down that way.
Thanks for listening today. If you haven't already, visit lstradio.com to listen to episode archives, make a contribution, and learn more about LST. We hope you join us next week for our show, where Debbie Merritt interviews Johanna Barde, a health law attorney for the state of Tennessee. I Am The Law is produced by Law School Transparency for LST Radio. If you want to hear more, you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or go to lstradio.com.